And uh, we are going to have a very good set of conversations here. Um, we have um, seven uh, agenda items. How many are here for item seven, which is point of sale? Raise your hand. Okay. Julie, are you here for that? For number seven? Okay. Um, all right. Uh, we're going to try to go quickly through things that are that are potentially consent. Uh, vacation uh, item number one, Adam. Yeah. Item number one: City Engineer report relative to the vacation of Alvarado Street portion of northwesterly side from approximately 50 feet to approximately 100 feet northeasterly of Baxter Street. Vacation E140949. Mm -hmm. Anybody here uh, against it today? Um, Mr. Smith, can we move that no one? No moved. Okay. That's um, excuse me, Councilman Rhodes. <laughs> what are we doing? Um, we've had a request Hello. from, oh, Your excuse me, Julia Moy, Bureau of Engineering. We've had a request from CD13 to remove conditions 3A, 3B, and 5, and we are in agreement. Okay. You're in agreement. Um, okay, we're in agreement. We, we have uh, agenda item people for this. For item number one, we, we have uh, Roger Bennett. You're for the proposal, Roger? Yes, thank you uh, very much. Uh, uh, Come to the mic, uh, just for the record. We, we'll go quickly on it, because if there's opposition, then we don't go quickly. My name is Roger Bennett. I'm the architect for this project, and I just wanted to make sure that the waivers, uh, have, as just put forward to you, uh, you got. So th that's the only reason I'm And you're happy about that? And, yes, I am. And no problems with that? Yes, okay. no so, problems. Mr. Smith, uh, so moved. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Okay, item number two. <laughs> item number two, continuing from February 4, 2009, City Engineer Report relative to the vacation of the walk adjoining Lot 63, Track 7454, from Sunbeam Drive to the east-west walk southerly thereof, vacation E1401018. Anybody here to speak against it? Go ahead. Um, for this item, Council Member Julia Moy, Bureau of Engineering, there's a technical correction. We are replacing conditions 5, A, B, and C with the following, that the owner of the property record a covenant and agreement stating that in the, even this property, or in the event that this property is to be redeveloped in the future, public improvements adjacent to this property will be required at that time. Mm -hmm. Sounds good to me. Mr. Smith? Okay. So moved. That's item number two. See how quickly we move around here, folks, as quickly as we can. Um, item number three. Item number three, motion, Cardenas Parks, relative to the feasibility of closing the pedestrian tunnel at Tonopah Street under the I-5 and I-170. Does B.O. we want to talk about this? Uh, no. 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 No? Okay. No? It's on the approved uh, list. Is there any opposition to this from anybody? Do you want to say anything? No. No comment. Okay, Mr. Smith? As long as the council members know the requirements with the state and I mean, there are, there are set requirements to do this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Come on in, Ron. Come on up. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Councilman Smith, Ron Olive, Bureau of Street Services. We did work with our friends in the Bureau of Engineering on this. Um, we did, our research shows that this pedestrian tunnel is owned and operated by Caltrans and again I apologize we did submit a one-page report yeah. um, rather late but yeah, it's right here. Okay. okay so we, we did um, uh, conclude that this is a Caltrans maintained tunnel we did send a formal letter to Caltrans asking for the closure and we have kept uh, Council District 6 in the loop and the only recommendation we're making is that any response we do get from Caltrans that we share with, with CD6 and try to do what we can to close this tunnel so first thing is receive and file this report is the first and instruct the Bureau of Street Service to advise Council District 6 of any Caltrans response. Yes. Okay. So moved and second. Thank you. Item number four. <laughs> Item number four, motion Gruel Lavange relative to developing standardized procedures for cookie cutter type projects and a process to develop a qualified list of contractors through a request for proposal process to then be able to issue mini RFPs for standardized facilities construction to decrease the time involved for constructing these facilities. This matter was considered by the Arts, Parks, Health, and Aging Committee on June 4, 2008. Mm -hmm. Anybody want to talk about this? Did they make any recommendations? The committee? Um, the, the, it says recommend approve. No, did the other committee make uh, changes? Did they? Uh, Does anybody know? There's no, there's no report here from the other committee. It says this matter was considered by Arts and Park Committee on June 4, 2008. 
Did they make a recommendation? Did they say anything? For the record, there, yeah. was, there was a recommendation to approve, and it would be a communication from that particular committee since there was only one uh, committee member present that day. Okay. I see. I see. Okay. I have one question. Um, once you've selected a list of contractors, is there a flexibility so if somebody comes in later and says, I want to be on that list too, I can get in the list if you have standard requirements? Or once you approve a list, it's like personnel. Once you approve a list, that's the list. Gary Moore, Bureau of Engineering. In, our, in, the, in doing this, our anticipation is these lists would be good for three years, and the answer is no. We, we'd like to uh, move things as fast as possible. And I think what we're looking for is, uh, uh, you know, that we would establish these lists, we'd use these lists and then open them up at the appropriate time unless Mike, what do you? Yeah, I, we tend to tend to move in that direction. The, the one that we have done, um, there would be, it was for skate parks and there would be an opportunity for people to submit at a later date, but. Um, How many people are on that list? Six. six. And it was all six that submitted made the list. It just it's just more and more work. It, yeah. A lot of it, like you know, what Gary is saying, is a lot of it depends on how many people you get submitting, and how, you know it, it 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 becomes quite cumbersome if you get twenty people mm -hmm. submitting. And but in that that particular case, we only had six, so we did not close it. And this is pattern like after uh, we have in uh, wastewater. Uh, rotating list for on-call construction contractors and so forth. Very accepted by the contracting community that when we open it back up, they'll have the opportunity to get back on the list. So it's not that it's not tried and true to, for us. And so, so you uh, have six on the list though, right? For the skate park one, kind of yes. Yeah. Yes. I just want to make sure, A, we had enough people on the list always. Mm -hmm. And in these times, contractors are going out of business right and left that we right. always maintain a list right. that's sufficient in number. Right. right. And, and going with these specialty, of course, you're looking with people, you know, we usually go out for qualifications requested. So you may get 12 people, to, but they may have had zero experience building skate parks. We want people who have had experience. So uh, it's tough times we recognize and we're, we try to be as lenient and flexible on certain things, but we're definitely looking for expertise. All right, uh, like Mr. Smith said, a group falls out due to the economy and all that. Uh, and how, how easy is it for somebody to get on the list? You publish it, you get a chance to become part of the mix? It's, it's a, normally, whether it's Bureau of Engineering or Rec and Parks, I mean, it, it's a request for proposal, so you advertise it. You, you know, you, you, form, you have a formal process, you have a, you know, an opening, um, just like you would a, you know, any public bid, right. um, so that it's completely transparent as to who submitted and, you know, when the bid, you know, everything's due on a certain date and a certain time, and it's open, you know, with every, you know, they're welcome to be present when we open them, that sort of thing. But right. ultimately, we have, the staff has to review the qualifications to make sure that they, and, and again, back to the skate park one, it, that one in particular, they all qualified. And right. so there wasn't any reason not to have them all on the list. Yeah, our intent is not to limit the numbers. I mean, uh, in the wastewater rotating list, and, uh, we have 20 on it. So, I mean, yeah. it, w the thing is just to get people who have had experience in that area. Right. City Attorney. Keith Pritzker, uh, Deputy City Attorney. I just wanted to um, uh, more specifically address the question you asked, which is uh, if other people come along later, can they get onto the list? And, the, and the, the answer is yes. However, we have to wait until the time period expires for which the original list was approved. We might uh, put out an RFP and say that this, is, this will be the list for the next two years or three years, and then they'll have to wait until another uh, RFP goes Unless out. Unless you determine the list is too short and yes. not viable anymore. Right, right. 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 Okay. Okay. Good motion there. So moved. Thank you. Appreciate it. Next item. Item number five, Board of Public Works report relative to a Class A permit claim for refund filed by the Pueblo Nuevo Development, Philip J. Lance, in connection with the construction of the Camino Nuevo High School, reference number 1145, located at 3500 West Temple Street. So how much are we looking at? Is it $47,409.25? According to the board report, uh, the refunding question is for $47,409.25. Anybody here to speak about this issue one way or the other, or up or down? Okay, motion, Mr. Smith. Was the 17, was the trees that were planted there the ones that were we actually wanted there, uh, or did they 
try and not do some of the work. Because I've had trouble with LA Unified mm -hmm. promising things and then not going through with them, following through with them, or trying to get out of things after they've already said, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. Um, so I, I just want to make sure that they've met all the all what we wanted as a city out of the project. Yeah, absolutely. Julian Moy, Bureau of Engineering. The Urban Forestry Division visited the site and saw, due to various obstacles, various utility facilities, that 17 was the number that they were happy with. Okay. Okay, um, but uh, the claimant's uh, desire for the 47,000, it's because we're totally finished with the projects, no more trees planted or anything else? Yes. So moved. That is item number five. We're up to item number six. Item number six continued from January 7, 2009. Motion, Laban Juizar, relative to the creation of a task force to examine ways to regulate the sale of cars on city streets and related matters. Okay, we have a card here from the public. Ricardo? Uh, yes. Come on up. Uh, Keith Pritzker, Deputy City Attorney. Uh, Tom Labonge asked that he be called and be allowed to speak on this item. Absolutely. Uh, can we contact Mr. Labonge and, and uh, ask, ask him to show up? Hold on a second. No, I want to see where Tom is. She's going to try the, that one. I'm going to try the cell. We're all going to try to get Tommy. We can always take public comment. Yeah, we'll take public comment. We have two more cards. Uh, I see that Alex uh, Mortensen, as well as Dr. Uh, is it Jana West? Come on up. All three of you. Tommy, we're up here in public works. You're going to join us right now? We got your issue up. Yeah, we're, we're waiting for you right now. Okay. <laughs> She's calling the staff. I got the, mm. the man. He's on the way. <laughs> <laughs> That's a dynamic duo. Here. Somebody's so gonna we can. Someone's going to find him sooner or later. How's we found him. Yeah. You're up first. Please. Name for the record. My name is Dr. Jonna West. I'm a chiropractor that lives in Los Feliz at 4221 Los Feliz Boulevard. And we are hoping that this measure gets approved because the um, for sale cars on our street are blocking parking spaces for residents as well as, as bringing in um, a lot of crime lately. A lot of our cars for people who live in the area have been getting broken into. Compelling. Sarah. Hi, I'm Ricardo Gomez. Uh, I'm a board member of the Los Feliz Improvement Association. I live adjacent to Los Feliz in the Franklin Hills area. This has been a problem for a long time for all of us. Uh, Hyperion Avenue, Los Feliz Boulevard, um, sections of Franklin. I frequently travel to the rest, west side. I see this problem along Wilton going down to Venice, Venice Boulevard going uh, west of Wilton. And I think what the exasperation is of the community is, is what's so difficult about regulating this matter. Uh, it's been going on for years. Uh, I'm aware of the constitutional challenge. I used to practice law. Yet that we have the Lawndale Ordinance, uh, which appears to be constitutionally valid on its face. Uh, we also have uh, California Streets and Highway Code Section 731, which is very similar to the Lawndale Code, and that relies on the vehicle, same vehicle code sections for enforcement. So you know, from my perspective, this is probably a four or five business day research project to, to determine the legality of it, plus you have a federal uh, court decision to look to for guidance. And I know the city attorney has a lot of work to do. But we're also you know, looking at a, at a, at a pretty um, messy operations here. And there's also the issue of these, these are commercial operations. They belong on a car lot. The tax mm -hmm. revenues belong going to the city. They belong paying property taxes. They shouldn't freeload off the city's infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Yes, my name is Alex Mortensen. I'm a private citizen, also residing in Los Feliz at 4221 Los Feliz Boulevard. And I'm basically here just to also support the uh, creation of this task force for the same reasons that uh, the other people have given so far as well. It has brought in a lot of uh, parking problems for myself and the other tenants in our building. And, and, you know, on any given weekend, there could be about up to words of 50 cars on the westbound lanes blocking all the traffic. So it's really gotten out, you know, it, I can understand, you know, if it's somebody in their own driveway, that's fine, you know, but this is, you know, people who don't live in the area, it's bringing in a lot of other unwanted problems as well, too, impeding traffic flows and, and other problems. So really support that this task force created and uh, solutions uh, brought up. 
appreciate that. City Attorney, I have to ask a couple quick questions. Thank you, three of you, very much. Thank you. City Attorney, is there a state law that allows for sale signs to be placed on vehicles parked on a public street? Um, I don't believe that uh, that there is. If state law preempts the city, what would be the next steps to manage this ongoing problem? You're just saying. I, I don't believe that there is a uh, state law that preempts the city. The problem we have is with the First Amendment uh, free speech rights. And, and that was the, uh, you know, we had a, an, another ordinance on the books uh, that went to federal court in the year 2000. Judge ruled against us. It's a published case. Uh, and the court ruled that because our justification for the earlier restriction uh, was based upon aesthetics, uh, and there wasn't anything more in the city record that that wasn't uh, adequate as a counterbalance against the commercial free speech rights of people who want to put a for sale sign in their car. Uh, so I, I've spoken at length uh, to uh, my um, two of my colleagues about this, uh, Shelley Smith, who, rep who uh, advises DOT, and I do that along with her. Uh, I've uh, spoken to Street Services. I've also spoken with the attorneys who handled that lawsuit back in the year 2000. And we've looked at the Lawndale Ordinance, and we believe that if we could put together some factual data that says that there, you know, we could, I could write up some whereas clauses about whereas there's not an abundance of uh, parking in certain areas, but we need some document that supports the whereas clauses that would then go with an ordinance that would be similar to, to that in Lawndale. The ACLU says that they're just not going to sue Lawndale because it's too small a city, but we're a big target. They're likely to sue us no matter what we do, and, and we in the city attorney's office want to make this ordinance this new ordinance is defensible as possible. Uh, so what I'm going to suggest is that I get together with city staff, meaning LAPD, street services, DOT, uh, and planning department in particular, and then figure out whether we have the internal resources to put together this uh, uh, factual document that, that we would then give to a judge if we're sued on this. Um, and if we don't, then we have to uh, hire an outside consultant to do a report that would support the justification for the need for this and the fact that it uh, overbalances or overweighs the commercial free speech rights of people that want to just leave and their cars on the street. How long do you think it'll the take the task force to get this together? How much time frame would you need? Uh, somewhere from uh, 30 to 60 days. Maybe we can set it at 45 days. Okay. And, and, and in the uh, initial listing here, it said building and safety, street services, LAPD and the city attorney, but you want, and it makes sense to me, DOT and planning as well. Yes. And that would be inclusive then? Do you think we include the, the right mix? Yes. If we, if we think we need, we need more uh, city departments, we'll, we'll ask, okay. invite them in. Okay. Uh, Mr. Labange, uh, three constituents got up and spoke, um, and they were clearly pointing out the problems. All these cars have been parking for them. Uh, Alex Mortensen, uh, Ricardo Gomez, and Dr. Jonah West. Uh, all right, Mr. Rosenthal or Mr. Smith, do you have any similar problem in your district? Yes, sir. Right. We do. So, okay, good. And also, I was looking at uh, there's certain impacted streets. Las Vegas is an impacted street in particular because of traffic. It's probably a great F street. It also leads to the, the park and its facilities, whether it's the observatory, the Greek theater on the southwest side of the, or the zoo or the picnic grounds, uh, the archery on the north. So with that designation, uh, the impact is great that it uh, does that, and I think we have to, if it would, would I ask our city attorney, could we call out certain streets and say, uh, right now Las Feliz, let's say, which is impacted, because there's so much gridlock traffic, then you're going slow to slow, and you look and it says for sale, for sale. So it's, yeah, I don't know if people would have, would create this type of, um, quote, street market on a street that has, not F traffic, because F traffic makes people go slow. So the answer is yes. You can call out city streets, but, but to get there, we have to start with creating a report from staff. And I, I see the key uh, agencies really as DOT, because they, they can tell us about uh, traffic issues in right. particular areas and, and planning. And to a certain degree. Well, let me just ask that General Service Police and Park Rangers be added to the task force as it relates to this particular boulevard, which is impacted. And the Griffith Park fire, which you know is just uh, a little over two years ago, Las Feliz was the lifeblood. And how that street moved 
his general services help with the LAPD patrol to do evacuations. LAPD motors cleared the streets so the fire trucks could go from one side of the park to the other. Mm -hmm. If you will, Mr. Chair and Mr. Vice Chair, I, my comments are complete. We're on the right track. I'm going to return to the district now to continue the work of the people. Is that okay? Uh, did, Adam, did you get the other two additions to the task force that he just mentioned? General Service Police and the Park Rangers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. God bless you. See you so much. Wonderful. Mr. Smith. Yeah, Mr. Prisker, um, could we, instead of doing all this work, which will take a lot of time, just replicate what we did on the unattached trailer ordinance and instead of trying to call out where there are problems in the city and what criteria, et cetera, just pass an ordinance like we do with unattached trailers. Says you put up a sign in the areas you don't allow it. It is legal under the state law. And that says that you can sell the cars on the streets, which makes the judge happy, but that we say you can't do it in these areas because of, and we just have to articulate because of traffic problems, congestion problems, crime problems, whatever, and not go through all this work because we already have an ordinance that did that for unattached trailers. Well, then, then we need to, uh, we, we could do that, but then we, we, ha we would identify particular streets yeah. where we would, where we would do that posting. I sent a letter as a councilman to the DOT, says, I want this street uh, signed for unattached trailers. Problem goes away. Okay, but but my point is, you know, we, it would entail the adoption of, of an ordinance. One way or the other, yeah, I understand. Right, right, and and we, uh, we want something of a of a factual nature that is supportive of that. Now, it may simply be a, a, a staff report, um, but that's better than what we had when we went to court in the year two thousand because right. there was just nothing. There's nothing. Um, so so uh, that's one of the things that I will have the uh, this task force look into when we meet and Shelley wrote that other ordinance so right that's a suggestion and, and what is it that and, and for the folks in here that you, you cited Lawndale just an FYI and Mr. Prisker alluded to it um, there are cities all over the state that have laws that are illegal that have never been challenged because they no one wants to waste their time uh, Simi Valley's got an ordinance on parking uh, motorhomes on the streets it's totally illegal it's been challenged in other big cities Courts have already ruled, but they don't change their ordinance, so they keep enforcing it because no one's challenged it. So L.A. is always the number one hit list, and, and just FYI, Lawndale. So on Lawndale, what is different about their ordinance um, that you would think we could either adopt or you think it's illegal? You, you mentioned what, what What they did, uh, and I think it was very smart, is they, they uh, talked about the scarce resource of parking on public streets. And very, very small. And that's really, that's a lot different. When, you're, when you have a scale and you're weighing, you know, free speech rights, commercial free speech rights over here, and, and, and what we were arguing in the year 2000 was aesthetics of, oh, we don't want to see these ugly signs in a car. The court said, forget your aesthetics issue. But if you say, you know, that, that, it, that on this particular area we have high density, it's zoned R3 or, or higher, you know, you, you've got very limited parking. Here's a list of all the problems we, that have occurred in this area, additional crime, uh, you know, businesses are impacted, and, and we, we just identify all those things. And that's, that's basically what, what Lawndale focused on. And, and uh, I would have our um, city staff focus on that same uh, concept, that this is affecting uh, businesses, it's affecting the safety of residences, the, the, uh, f you know, the ability of their enjoyment of their property, because they can hardly have people come and visit them. Um, but we just need some, uh, some staff uh, time to help flesh out those arguments and then, uh, we, you know, if we're sued, we put that in front of a judge, and I think we stand a much better chance. And, our, and uh, frankly, the lawyers who litigated this in 2000 have advised that uh, they think that we would stand a much better chance if we have that. And those attorneys will be uh, in the loop and reviewing any documents that we come up with uh, for the council. And is there any chance you can get me Judge Mark's address? Because I'd love to park like a Beverly Hills truck <laughs> in front of his house first and see how long that law would last. That's off the record now. Well, you, that's on the record. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to do that. Just well, you know what happens when uh, people get really personally in, in, involved in some of these things. You know, it's it's hard it's hard to keep a somebody who's uh, general manager of uh, animal services in this city because of uh, certain interest groups that uh, like to go after them. Like the city council, you mean. Oh, I wasn't thinking <laughs> of the city council. <laughs> okay.
Thank you for your, your comments, uh, Ms. Smith. We have a motion to move it, and, and we want to get back in 45 days, okay? All right, second and so noted. Uh, uh, we'll come back with the task force. Uh, you'll get the task force together now. You'll have the discussions. In 45 days, you'll give us your, your plan. Yeah, learned opinion. So in the interim, we're holding the side of a committee then? Pardon me? <laughs> Pending the report, we're holding the side of a committee? Yeah. <laughs> Now we're down to item number seven. Item number seven continued from February 20th, 2008, Bureau Street Services report relative to a point of sale plan for sidewalk repair and related matters. Okay, we do have one uh, public opinion card here. Are there any other uh, public uh, cards? Uh, come on up, uh, David uh, Kissinger. Long time no see, like yesterday. <laughs> Hey, David, you're up. <clears throat> Thank you. Good afternoon, council members. Uh, David Kissinger with the South Bay Association of Realtors. Um, I'm, I'm joined by my colleague, James ward of the Beverly Hills uh, Greater Los Angeles Association of Realtors, and there's also a third individual who couldn't be here with us today. Together, we represent approximately 12,000 realtors in the city of Los Angeles. Um, it's really briefly, point of sale. Um, as we've communicated with the council in the past, we have very significant major concerns about the effectiveness of point of sale. Um, and I'll just keep that comment very brief. Um, just to encapsulate it, uh, on the city's perspective, this will not work. It cannot work. It, it, the, the laws of physics and the laws of finance show that it, point of sale cannot work from the city's perspective. Um, also, if point of sale were to be tied into um, a, a longer list of other solutions, and that also concerns us if only because think of it as an opportunity cost where the city is effectively allocating limited resources toward the least efficient program. So um, what I wanted to do is because we're, we're concerned in, in our industry that we want to be saying yes to things and not no to things. And so, um, Mr. Chairman, at the risk of going over my time, I actually have a list of items and I'll just go over them and just mention it in detail. Um, what we would all list for you, what we would request, if we may, is that these be studied in greater detail, that these also, the study include in comp a comprehensive financial pro forma review of precisely where the funding would come from, where it would go, how the cash flows would work, if only on a month to month basis for here 20 years out. And I think that would help the council make an, uh, an informed and effective decision on what's the best way to fix the sidewalks. Um, the first time you've heard a little bit about assessment districts, and I know you've studied them in other formats here, but what I want to point you to um, is what I think is very useful in my area. The city of Manhattan Beach today is using an assessment district program. Um, uh, for Keep the clock going. I just want to record the number of minutes he speaks, but we're not going to stop. Thank you. Um, anyway, Manhattan Beach, they're underground utilities. Um, the, this is contemplating a capital cost which is more than 10 times greater than what is suggested under the Los Angeles sidewalk repair. So it is significant. There, the, there are a chunk of approximately, or district I should say, of about 300 homes. They are assessed, um, it's administered by the county assessor, it's amortized over 20 years, um, which puts the capital dollars up front in the hands of public works or a private contractor with minimal cost to the city's general fund. Um, even though Manhattan Beach is not the size of a jurisdiction as is the city of Los Angeles, I would, uh, we believe that there is some value that the city can acquire from that. Um, and the, the side of repair, the next item, and the side of repair task force that we were um, happy to be a part of <coughs> last year and in the previous year, we were talking off and on about the assessing an individual. At that context, it was assessing the individual at the point of sale. Um, and so, you know, we're, um, again, the homeowner or the seller or some party would be assessed and um, have to, you know, pay some fee up front or pay through property taxes up front. Um, the individual assessment is useful, but rather than point of sale, I want to suggest two other solutions that we are studying in our industry, um, but I'm going to throw them out there anyway. They are called, we call them date certain and point of service. Date certain is basically this. Um, where you ask the city, ask the homeowner, dear homeowner, by date certain, let's say 24 months out from today, you effectively certify that you have completed this assessment with the county assessor and those funds are available. Uh, you know, if you do certify, we're done. If you don't, then you face certain civil penalties, if you like, whether it's a fine, whether it's an extra fee, whatever is most effective for the city. Um, 
what that also does is, again, it puts capital dollars up front, minimal cost to city. It does not impact the escrow process. The other one, point of service, um, and this is kind of a, a parallel. When a, and it's almost contradictory, but when a new homeowner or a new resident or a new um, business occupant in a commercial condo goes into their new setting, they start new service. They start new DWP service, new gas, trash, water service. Um, at that point of service is basically another identifier, a trigger where then you could um, identify what that need is. And so you can even say at the point of service, um, whether it's a homeowner or an HOA or some other party would certify that those funds are being assessed and are available that the city can use. Again, at minimal, um, or I should say lesser cost to the city. Um, those are those solutions primarily are the most interesting to us because we do appreciate the limited amount of resources that the city has and we would really like to see them just studied in greater detail and think they could be much more useful and more effective at a larger hitting a larger volume of properties in a lesser amount of time than the piecemeal process of bouncing from one home to sale to the next because again the rhetorical question is where is the next home going to be sold or I should say going to be listed for sale Obviously, we cannot know that even in the best of markets, we still cannot know that, which means you have a perpetually inefficient allocation of city resources where um, city staff is waiting until the next call comes for the next home listed for sale. Uh, moving on, I'll just mention a few more. Um, we've uh, talked off and on about existing lighting districts, and um, we understand that's an ongoing issue, I believe, especially in the Valley, if that right, um, I, uh, you know, looking at funding for lighting districts um, can, the existing lighting district be combined with funding for other needs, and I'm not sure what the appropriate mechanism is, is not, but you know, for example, um, street tree, parkway, curb and gutter, apron, sidewalk, um, slurry seal, you know, and then can that district, that council office, or that neighborhood council, or that area most effectively allocate those resources for them that they could use in that area? Um, and then just very briefly, um, a few other things, ARA funds, American Reinvestment Redevelopment Act funds, CDB funds, excuse me, CDBG funds, can they be effectively used? Um, been, actually, we have been using CDBG funds for in, in certain areas, right. uh, very limited areas. Right. Um, and, and then also, um, I believe uh, Council Member Smith, did, uh, I think maybe mentioned a, rev, a revenue anticip anticipation bond at some point in the past, and I don't know if the current environment might allow that, but is that a solution? And if so, could you even contemplate, um, since I understand the 50-50 program, is effectively off the table. Would you consider, if you like, a hybrid 50-50 program where 50% comes from some sort of a bond situation and the other 50 comes from an individual assessment identified at the point of service or a date certain program? So I mean, those are just a few things that we want to go out there. Um, the, again, some of them are being used today. I believe that Manhattan Beach's program is very successful. It is ongoing um, and it's something that we do support and we you know, again, we're grateful that the city has invited our industry to work with the task force and coming up with these solutions. And we want to continue that, and we're ready to continue. But we do have major concerns that point of sale uh, just won't get you to where you need to go. It's, and so um, yeah, that's pretty much it, and I'm happy to answer any of the questions you have. Okay, thank you. You can stay over there on the side there, but um, that's about eight minutes, uh, seven minutes, and, uh, and 40 seconds, just for the record there. Um, could we have some answers to some questions, staff? Uh, please recap the action that the City Council took on Monday at the special budget session, and, and there are a few other questions more. So, in fact, so you get a gist of it. One is to recap the action the Council took uh, on Monday. Two is talk about outstanding steps necessary uh, to implement point of sale. Uh, and third is please talk about some of the outstanding issues that remain as we move ahead for point of sale and please discuss how an assessment district program could be another alternative for the sidewalk repair. So let's start with the first question. Please recap the action that the City Council took on Monday at the special budget uh, session. Council Member, I'm David Hirano from the Office of CAO. On Monday, the Council instructed the, or requested the City Attorney to return with two ordinances, one that would effectively put the responsibility for sidewalks back on the property owner uh, and away from the city of Los Angeles and the second one that would contemplate imp implementing the point of sale program. Mm -hmm. Second question is please talk about the outstanding steps necessary to implement the point of sales program. 
Keith Pritzker, Deputy City Attorney. Uh, well, we'll we'll need to uh, obviously uh, draft an ordinance that uh, will require uh, property owners to repair their property uh, at the time they put the property up for sale. That is to repair the uh, the sidewalks should they need a repair. The other thing that we need to do is to uh, eliminate a certain part of our municipal code that says that the city is uh, responsible for damage done by street trees. Uh, and that was adopted uh, several decades ago, uh, and, w and it would simply be a matter of taking that off the books, um, and the responsibility would revert to the property owners. So this is um, the city attorney come back. Uh, this this is uh, municipal code ordinance section sixty two point one zero four. Yes, that removes uh, the clause that refers to. Well, there's a subsection. I think it's E, that uh, that we'd be eliminating. Okay, please talk about some of the outstanding issues that remain as we move ahead with point of sale. That's it. Um, well, I, th I think uh, hey, Mr. Robertson might might have some of those because we've been in joint uh, meetings uh, on and off for a year or so about this. Good afternoon, council members. Bill Robertson, director of the Bureau of Street Services. This issue, of course, uh, Mr. Smith and Mr. Parks, way back in uh, I guess it was uh, uh, two five uh, yeah. two thousand five. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> we've been working on this, and this is a, a very uh, difficult question. And I certainly want to thank the real estate industry who's been a, uh, had a great deal of valuable input on what we've looked at. Um, and when we last met almost 11 months ago, there was three items that we need to, to flush out. One was we wanted the CAO to come back to us, the risk manager, and tell us what has been the impact of the limited sidewalk program we've had in the city of Los Angeles since 99-2000. That report came back, clearly shows that we're eliminating liability. Uh, the number of claims has dropped. However, the dollar amount for those claims has gone up. Uh, so we did see, based from what the risk manager said, it's being effective. The second question was, uh, and a number of the issues that the real estate folks brought to us, we went to the uh, CAO's revenue side, their bond folks, looked at all the various options we could take. Because one of the critical things was the real estate group was saying that these would be uh, no cost to the city. Of course, we know that when you bond, uh, you do assessments, there are costs. So we have that information now. The final chapter that I needed answered was probably the most critical, is who owns the sidewalks. Uh, we did a historical study going back to 1885, the Vrooman Act. We've listed every city attorney opinion through the years in regards to sidewalks. And it clearly states uh, that the underlying fee uh, belongs to the real estate holder. We do not own sidewalks. We do not own the streets. We do not own the street trees that are doing the damage. So now that that has been clarified by the city attorney um, and with the actions that the council took, I'm recommending that we move forward remove the portion of the existing to put it back to where the property owner is responsible. Doesn't mean we take any action. Doesn't mean we enforce anything. The question becomes, what would be the trigger? What is the trigger, whether it's inspections, whether it's a filing of a trip and fall claim? Is it when you sell your property? Is it when you take out a permit to do $20,000 more of structural rehabilitation to the structure? Those are the main issue. What is going to be our trigger? Uh, my recommendation is, again, that you allow me to come back in 30, 30 days with a full report. I'll reissue the original historical report we did, uh, the current uh, response from the city attorney. I'll further vet the, uh, the new proposals that the real estate group has brought forward showing the actual cost for all these various programs. The biggest and hardest element of point of sale or any sidewalk program is where do you get the front money to begin the work? Where does it come from? Uh, certainly assessment districts, we know the issues with Prop 218, uh, the inability to, as your costs go up, your inability to raise your uh, uh, assessment fees coming in. Uh, we've seen concrete jump double, almost triple in the last five years alone. So how do we run that program? We've seen the struggles of street lighting based on a 218 assessment type district. So 
if I could come back in 30 days with a full report addressing what the CAO, both the risk manager and the bond people have told us, uh, and addressing some of the real estate issues again, at that time after that 30 days, I would like to convene maybe for 60 or 90 days an outreach program. Because there, there are things that we could do with point of sale. I mean, you could issue exemptions. Uh, short sales could be an exemption. Foreclosures could be an exemption. Low income could be an exemption. There's a whole host of options that we have available that's, to us. That's almost 90% of the market right yeah. now. <laughs> right now, exactly. And, and that's why I made it clear in budget and finance that yeah. we need this year. We need this year to fully vet this and come up with a solid plan uh, that's going to be acceptable to everybody in the city. This is a problem, uh, a $1.2 billion backlog. If we wanted to wipe it out in 10 years, that's $124 million a year mm. just on sidewalks. Mm. Uh, so it's a huge issue. We've ignored this problem for so long. And of course, I have to admit the simple is answer is we amend the, the ordinance and we just start citing people. But I don't think anybody wants that, especially in these times that we're facing. So, we need to establish a good trigger, a trigger that will be acceptable to all, uh, and certainly look at some of the other financing options, which are extremely limited right now. Because uh, certainly if we had the money for a 50-50, we'd have a 50-50 this year, but the money's not there. Uh, and we certainly don't have front money um, to have a sidewalk program work in the future. One of the key benefits of point of sale uh, based on the number of sales and the additional sidewalk that would be done. And it may not be the most efficient because we are going place to place. But if we sent, if we set up a standard that within six months we collected all the sales in a geographical area, <laughs> it would then become more efficient. But one of the key issues here is a workforce training program similar to the old CETA program or even the vocational worker program. And I'm not saying those programs would have to come in the city. They would then have a skill that they could use on the open market, uh, or if we did have available positions, they could come in and have a, uh, a good job. So those are the key issues. Um, well, and I thank Bill for that. One thing about Bill that always comes forward with a, a well thought out presentation, uh, and you're always looking from the best policy point of view, how do we do this, how do we do the job best? So. I always commend you on that. I think what we fail to recognize sometimes is the unintended consequences of what we do in policy. And that would be uh, our second and third largest source of revenue for the city is the documented transfer tax and the real estate property tax, both of which are in a huge downward cycle. And to do anything to continue that cycle downward or to uh, hurt the revenue streams at this moment in time is, I mean, we're on life support right now. We don't need that. And so uh, I have said repeatedly over the years, I think having the realtor, real estate industry or realtors be our agents in getting streets, uh, sidewalks fixed is inappropriate and, and a wrong way to go and unfair to them. Um, and I don't think it, was, it would be totally productive, yet the problem exists. You heard some very good ideas from them today, uh, and I hope we'll continue on that discussion path. I, I think in the perfect world, uh, now that we've made the corrections in the ordinances, and, and I love this analogy, we've, we've now dropped the 1911 Act and gone to 1915. Mm -hmm. We were showing great progress. We're only <laughs> 94 years behind the curve instead of 98. But um, the fact of the matter is we've done the things we need to do to structurally correct the problems that the city of L.A. brought upon itself. Correct. And now we can go forward. And the, and the best way to do that is either have realtors just sign a document says this, as we are selling this house, the sidewalk needs repair, or we go on citation basis or trip and fall basis, that we now have a reason to go to the homeowner and say, you have this responsibility. But only, and, and we don't want to start this war, but only if we had a process of financing for them. Exactly. And so I would suggest to you a motion I brought in about six months ago for solar roofs, and, and that is replicating a, a program done in Berkeley that says if you want a solar roof, you have the this DWP pays for half of it, and the other half you can put on your property tax and pay it off for 20 years, financing on their individual homeowner's responsibility to the property tax, because even when they sell, the next homeowner bears the responsibility. Mm -hmm. So it gets paid no matter what. And maybe replicating that into this system, saying that 
on the sale of property and or a trip and fall and or a, a complaint that we notify the homeowner and give them the option to do it themselves or to come to us and say with a, approval we will now put this on your property action you're, you're essentially financing it at government expense for 20 years then all we have to do is create the funding mechanism that we get the money up front through a revenue anticipation note or whatever so I, I think there's creative ways to solve this problem I think having the real estate industry do it is the wrong one because uh, it's an industry on its back right now and we don't need to be throwing dirt on it um, at any time really um, you know we fought huge battle just years ago about a three or four hundred dollar earthquake valve that wouldn't stop anybody from buying a house a seven thousand dollar bill for fixing a sidewalk would stop somebody from buying a house and, and so there's a huge difference I doubt I doubt if realtors have lost one single sale over earthquake valves not one <laughs> if they tell me they did I won't believe it <laughs> but if you came and you said I would lose a thousand potential sales over a seven thousand or eight thousand dollar bill for a sidewalk I would believe that. Mm -hmm. so I think we got to find a way to be creative. Um, we did it many years ago when we did the um, URM ordinance on unreinforced masonry buildings, and, and we had 8,000 in the city of LA, 8,000 buildings. And we put together a bond finance program where they could borrow the money and pay it back. And, and we now have all but I think 30 something buildings fixed in the city. Those were 15 to $50,000 bills, each one of those. So I think if we are creative, use the powers that the, the police powers the government have to create bond funding and those kind of things um, we can come up with a better program I think and that that's going to be my position I am not going to support point of sale just as point of sale unless we have some better mechanisms so and with that as a backdrop let's go back and come back with the report let's incorporate with what Mr. Smith said and what Mr. Kissinger was suggesting I consider it a work in progress. I don't feel uh, feel the pressure that we must get an ordinance out tomorrow morning. Mm -hmm. uh, so the instructions are clear. Direct city attorney to come back in 30 days with an amended that deals with that tree business that we're talking about. Direct Bureau of Street Service to come back uh, with a written report detailing other possible alternatives. How much time do you want for that? Uh, I said, well, the I information said I have, days, now, but I, 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 if I could get 45, because yeah. I would like to look at what Greg, I'll yeah. pull the, yeah. the It's only motion. been five years. So. Yeah. <laughs> so I was going to say, I have I no time sensitivity minutes. on mine. Yeah. Yeah. So do you want 45 or 60? Let, let's, let's say 60, and that way I can, I can do a good job, and if I need to call the real estate folks in and bring create the subcommittee yeah, back in, I can do that. So. Um, I think, I think you've got a good spokesman here that represents a lot of people. On it. And how about you, city attorney? You want, want that same 60 days? Oh, no. If, I, if, if I'm doing 30 days. Uh, th 30 days is fine, because all I need to submit back to you is uh, that we're deleting a, uh, an existing uh, language in an ordinance. Okay. So I'll, so I'll, I'll back in 30 days? Yes. Yeah, that's okay. easy. Now, how about the ordinance? <laughs> no, that's what I'm saying. That that that's what the but the new ordinance. I need direction on on, on what that ordinance is going to be. Okay, right. Yeah, and that's what you're <laughs> like to chat before I leave here. office in two years. Yeah, you, you know, right, no, but but you're going to chat with Bill on that as time goes on, so that we get in the same wavelength. Yes, and and you know one of the questions, uh, Councilman, that you posed a minute ago that we didn't address was assessment districts. Right. And uh, as you may know, with Bureau of Street Lighting, assessment districts are uh, a very large problem. Uh, partly because of uh, Prop 218. So uh, when we have these discussions, we probably want to bring street lighting into the discussion so we understand the problems that they've faced and uh, you know, vet whether uh, that's a viable option or not. In, in under 218, is it possible to craft an, an assessment district that builds in the a, a cola basically for yes the, all you need is the so people you don't to have vote to keep for going it. back after, once they do an initial approval you don't have to go back and back and yes back. And, and in fact that's been done in the county Good. Uh, in in uh, landscape ma that. landscape maintenance districts in certain county unincorporated areas have colas in them we need to do that that should be a matter of policy okay. yeah. so you've got right. the instructions right. right motion, motion. Yeah. First. second okay right. two instructions thank, thank you, you. Stay close to them, David. Okay. Any, any other public comment? Any other new business? Do I hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you all for coming. Hey John. John.